I see, see Steve Director is attending. Yep. Getting ready to leave for uh, Cape Cod. What did you ask, Daryl? I see Steve, Steve Director is attending. I believe he's getting ready to, you know, he shuttles between Darryl, are you Cape talking Cod to in me? the summer and Emory uh, and Atlanta in the winter. Daryl, are you, are you talking to me? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I was daydreaming. Anyway, Daryl, go ahead and get started. The floor is yours. Ready? The floor is yours. Okay, so a little bit about me. Um, I am, this talk will be very different from Ruth's. Um, the major reason I'm in this club is because I meet people like Ruth who are artistically inclined and see the world in that way. Me, when I was young, uh, growing up 50 miles from Cape Canaveral, I built and launched rockets. I then went, got into model trains where my interest is in, was in all of the technique of trains. And then I went to college where I majored in biology. And then I went to graduate school at the University of Chicago, speaking of Chicago, for a PhD in biological psychology. And then I did brain research for nearly 50 years. So um, I'm the other side of psychology and I learn uh, of psychology of photography and I learn a lot in this club. So naturally my talk is about technique here and it was originally to cover a lot more, but like Rue, I found there was too much. And so <laughs> I actually have, Elsie, if you want another talk later, I've got another talk. All yeah, ready. I find it interesting. You both warned me, oh, I don't have enough. And then uh, I'm like, well, gee, Drew, <laughs> you know, what's that about? <laughs> All those kinds of lenses. I'm gonna, this is just going to be about one kind of lens. Okay. All right. And you see the lead, because I, I just see it on my computer here. Fun with unusual lenses, one, tilt and shift. So... I bought my first digital SLR. I had to go look up when. Nikon D70 came out in 2004. So I figured I bought it in 2005. Had a whole six megapixels. Had interchangeable lenses. Uh, had autofocus. Um, before that time, I had done slide photography, 35 millimeter, for decades. I'll just tell you the results. They're awful. <laughs> and I soon found out that the Nikon lenses for the camera were very expensive. I never believed I'd spend so much money for a camera. So my response was to buy third party lenses from companies like Tamron and Sigma. And um, that was before I found out about the prices of other things, backpacks, tripods, unbelievable. And, but those lenses, they were pretty terrible actually. Uh, I have to tell you that Tamron and Sigma have really upped their game. They make some great lenses now. But if you went back into the early 2000s, wasn't the case. So now you can buy great lenses. Uh, you can plap them, slap them on your camera and get terrific pictures with just a modicum of learning. Uh, so I'm interested in older lenses and design. And you'll find out that a lot of lenses until recently, like at Olympus, they had some guru, someone who was the design person for the lenses and had this magic. I figure now, because people like Cameron are doing so well and companies you never heard of, uh, they're all using computer workstations that are designing the things. So that makes me even more interested in some of the old kinds of lenses and the tilt shift lens I'm going to tell you about came about in the 19th century, at least the background knowledge. I have to point out that uh, I first encountered a tilt shift lens on a club photo shoot when Don Stevens showed it to me. And little did I know at that time that Don Stevens would send me on the route to possible bankruptcy because these lenses can be expensive as you'll see. So if I go bankrupt from buying lenses, it's Don's fault. I see he's attending tonight. 
So I'm going to tell you what you can do with various sorts of tilt shift lenses and give examples with a wide range of prices. This is the one I bought, $2,200 for this thing. And it is a Nikon TC. They don't call them tilt shift. That's Canon. They call them TS. Nikon calls them PC for perspective control, I think it is. Hey, Daryl. Correction. Yes. Daryl. Yes. At $2,200, do you have a night job we don't know about? Uh, well, <laughs> I just uh, saved some money. So, <laughs> anyway. It, I'm, I'm we'll get down to less expensive lenses. So, but remember, it's all Don's fault. Uh, so, uh, this here it is, straight off their web page, and this is in the resting position, and you see all these funny knobs on it and so forth. More about that in a minute. It, when it's in the resting position, it's an extremely sharp, totally manual, 24 millimeter f 3.5 lens. They sell them in other sizes too. I believe the one that Don had. He can pipe up if he wishes, was um, a higher focal length uh, because he was doing product photography, I think. Now, here's the nifty thing about them. Here's your sensor. If you look into your camera, you'll see it sitting right there in the mount, behind the mount. And the image circle coming out of the lens has to fall on the sensor and cover it. And you don't want to go much beyond that. And the result is because of lens construction, the sharpest place on the sensor is the center of it. Not because of the center, it's because that's the sharpest place on the lens. You'll read lens reviews and they'll talk about, oh, how it gets soft as you go out to the edge. Well, that's it. Well, tilt shift lenses, the sensor is going to effectively move around. Now, you're not really moving the sensor. You're moving the, cir the circle of the image around. But you have got to make it big. So it can fall where the sensor is in this part of it. Or at another time, the sensor is in this part of it. So this lens has to wiggle about and <laughs> move where the light circle falls on the sensor? What part of the light circle falls on the sensor? So the tilt part is where you slip the image over to the, to the side. You'll see a drawing in a moment. And it makes the, the image be largely in focus throughout. So here's a slide picture, a slide of a picture I took just a couple of years ago at Gibbs Gardens, which I recommend. They now are in the state where they're showing what you'll see in my picture, uh, which is they believe they have more daffodils planted than anywhere in the world. It's about an hour north of Atlanta. So I took along my 24 millimeter tilt shift lens and look. Ever seen acres of daffodils right there in front of you? They have something like 20 million. Now, here's the deal with the shift. This is in tilt mode. We're in focus up close. We're in focus a little further back. We're in focus back, <laughs> back, back into the image. And this is the kind of thing landscape photographers fight with all the time. You know, you want to get this particular thing in the image fo in focus. So you go a third of the way into the picture or so forth, and you focus there, all these things to do. Well, the tilt shift lens, you basically bend the lens. So instead of going out straight, it's like it's hovering over the landscape. Here's another one from Gibbs. Daryl, Daryl, what's your rest stop on that one? I have to go look at the original. Uh, we'll get to f-stop in a moment. Okay. I mean, normally you increase f-stop, I mean, I'll say it now. So if you got a conventional lens, you increase the f-stop. But when you get to a certain area, let's say above f16, diffraction sets in and you start to lose sharpness. You don't have that problem with these things. Well, can I ask a question now or do you yeah, have to? Ask away. My question is, uh, if I use 
you know, stacking focus. Okay. Oh, you read minds. And I use uh, software. They're called changing perspective. I do that all the time. Okay, so, so what I you do with focus that. stacking. And and you would I don't you're up close. Focus stacking another one and, further uh, out. And another one further where? out. Merge them. Here's the problem with landscape: the wind. Branches move. You merge them all in your computer, and dad gum, there's that blur where that branch was. With tilt shift, one shot, it's all done. But otherwise, I, yes, I use focus stacking all the time. Yeah. Hey, and Daryl. That's when it works. Yes? Daryl, this is Don. Uh, culprit surfaces. Yes. Something, uh, are you going to talk about Scheimflug? Stay tuned. I'm glad you pronounced it. Hang, hang tight. All right. Well, I'm going to give the reason. Yes. All of this stuff about tilt shift lenses is fairly recent in 35 millimeter photography because it was very difficult. Okay, you got to see it. So Here it is. The uh, 18 late 1800s. He died in 1911. Okay, but anyway. That technique, Scheimflug and the unlimited depth of field, even wide open on the lens, that comes from uh, adjustable bellows cameras, view cameras. And it You'll also comes from cheap, common Kodak cameras from 100 years ago and so. All right, I'm going to zoom ahead. Zoom, zoom, zoom. There you go. Here's a guy you may know with one of those. His name is Ansel Adams. Yeah. Here's the bellows you can buy right now. No but, reflect, but it is $2,600, <laughs> includes the lens. But that bellows on 35 millimeter doesn't do the same thing, doesn't do as well as on a view camera because it has to uh, function through the lens mount, which is too small. And the barrel of the lens, once it's tilted, vignettes and uh, Anyway, the, the, the Scheimflug effect and the shift effect for straightening buildings and so on, that dates back way into the early 1900s on cheap Kodak cameras and cheap other cameras. And, and view cameras, it dates back to the 1860s and so on. Uh, Ansel Adams with his bellows here. You just tilt the, the, the film has been, which can be something like eight by 10 inches, has been slid into a frame that Adams is looking at. And he's going to throw a black curtain over his head. And he's going to see the image on the screen. And he's going to tilt the thing until he feels he's got it all in focus. Daryl? Yes. Who needs an iPhone when you can throw a, something over your head that's black hey, and tilt something? I'm going to talk about that too. Yes. I don't know why iPhones are so popular. They should go back to this. This is no, so wait, wait, wait. iPhones can do can fake it. Okay. I always wanted to throw a, something black cloth over my head. All right, I gotta get back to where I was. Where was I? Joe. Yes. Would you prefer twenty-four or thirty-five millimeter for the tilt shift lens? For landscape, I like twenty-four. Don, what did you have originally when you did product photography with these things? Remember what it was? What focal length? Are you talking to me? Yes. Yes. What focal length did, tilt shift did you use for product photography? Uh, eight inch on four by five. <laughs> no, but I thought you had a Nikon, but it was a. Yeah. I, I, that's one of the last new Nikon lenses I bought. Maybe it was the last one. It was an 85 Fair. millimeter tilt shift. Yeah. 85. And that was kind of an odd size, but it, it had lots of coverage because that focal length made a big circular image at the back. And it had uh, the tilt shift mechanism built in. Very good lens. Yeah. Thank you. I had to get to my second screen here. I lost it for a moment. So here is Scheimflug in his Austrian military uniform. 
And uh, this shows you, here's your lens. So the camera would be here and it's tilted. So here's the subject plane, like that field of daffodils I'm looking at. And so it takes all of that and sends it onto the sensor of the camera here. You see, so the, the lens is tilted, pointing down. The sensor is vertical. And be, by doing this, it flips it right on there and tries to leave much of it in focus. The question from Mike about, well, can't you just increase your f-stop? I told you the problem. You can crank down the aperture. You can get diffraction. You can also start to have long exposure duration, problems with landscape, things blowing in the wind, and high ISO. But if you I'm set up Scheinflug, if you set up for the Scheinflug effect, it's sharp wide open. Yeah. Uh, this is for Rue. This is reverse Scheinflug. And this is a picture, I didn't do it. Chicago River. It's green looking, so I don't know, maybe it's St. Patrick's. And uh, <laughs> there's the boat. Now you see the boat, you see all these people look like they're miniatures. You're familiar with this. You can do this with things like iPhones. They do it with software. But that also does that. But then there are other cool things. Hang on here. You're going to see some. We've been through tilt. Now for shift. Shift, the lens rides up and down vertically on your camera or side to side horizontally on your camera. It slides. That's the shift part. So they're particularly, as Don alluded, used by architectural photographers and product photographers. So I grabbed my, my lens and last week, ran outside of the psychology building at Emory. I'm retired, but I still have a little hideout in there. So here's the exact same lens acting as a regular lens. And you gotta tilt it up to get it in where I'm, if I went further back, yes, I could get it, but then billing would be smaller. You can see what's happening. It looks like it's falling backwards. It's tilting in on both sides. Fooey. Yeah, you can try to fix that in Photoshop or other programs. But you know what they do, they crop. They fix it and then you get this result and you've lost a big part of your image because it's cropped it. All right, with shift, I simply slid the lens vertically. Look what happened, straightened out. Nifty. That's the major reason that architectural photographers use these things. One day, I'm, I had to go look and see, I actually use this lens at it. I was in Buckhead, great sky. I had the thing in the trunk of my car. But a great picture, we just didn't have all those automobiles in there and that crane in the background. I suppose I could clone it out. But taking out the automobiles would be kind of tough. But boy, look, the sky, the sky reflections on the buildings. So this is tilting in Buckhead. You know, there are people who go tilting in Buckhead, but they drink too much. That's how they do it. <laughs> Here's another trick you can do with shift. You can slide it to the left, take a picture. Pull it in the middle, take a picture. Slide it to the right and take a picture. Put it in Photoshop and merge the whole thing, just like a panoramic. I ran out my backyard. These are crested irises. Uh, they're making their way through all of this pine straw that fell. The print is 12 inches by 24 inches at two feet wide without me enlarging at all. And uh, I just merged it. You can dive right in there and it's sharp. If I had a cannon, the cannon tilt shift can not only shift but tilt at the same time. So I can have the thing going into focus way back here as well as being panoramic. I think you need some roundup. Well, Roundup will kill the plants, so I don't kill them. <laughs> if you know these kind of irises, they'll take over your lawn. You know, then you have to mow anymore. So here's another shift thing I did. Church. This is St. Bartholomew's over on La Vista Road. 
I'm in there. They have a, uh, a maze outside. You know, people do meditation while they walk these things. So this is a window there. And here you see the rafters in the church of the roof. And that was done, one photo taken with the shift mode. So you can buy tilt shift. You can buy tilt only. You can buy shift only. I recently bought a shift only lens from Laowa um, in China uh, for Nikon Z mount. Uh, Z mount, like with the, this is mirrorless. Uh, the mount opening is something, it's huge compared to the F mount. Canon, Nikon, they're all switching to mirrorless bit by bit. You can buy tilt shift adapters that you can put on your camera. A lot of them are made where you then can put a lens from somebody else on, just a regular lens. Here's the Canon tilt shift. Hey, Daryl. $100. Yep. When you buy, Daryl, pardon me, uh, if you don't mind, when you buy an adapter, do you, what, do you sacrifice some sort of, uh, you sacrifice some resolution with that quality? I really no, because I haven't done that. Okay. Uh, but you're going to see in a moment, there are some uh, manufacturers who've now got tilt shift out for most of the, the major cameras. You'll see in a moment. Here's the Canon, and here it's tilted. This gives you an idea what it looks like when you tilt. Hey, Drill, how, yep. long, how long would it take you to adjust everything to make what you want to take? <laughs> You're really smart. And they're very fiddly. Uh, I ha it takes a while. In fact, I had to go back to books and say, am I not doing this right? Because you turn the knob, you see a knob right here, and you can see the, the, the crude way of looking at the degrees that it shifts, it tilts rather. And you just take pictures and you figure out what you need to do. It is fiddly. So what's the about, time, Yang, would it take about 10 minutes? Hmm? Would it take about 10 minutes to get what you want? Oh no, not that long. And here we got digital cameras. You get instant feedback. So you just blow it up on your screen on the back of the camera and move around and see if, where it's in focus. Okay, thanks. Here's a Samyang out of Korea. They also sell most Rokinon for less money. I don't know why. And this is for Nikon F, Canon EF, Sony A and E, Fujifilm X, and Micro Four Thirds. And you can see the price is coming down here. And uh, I took a hard look at it uh, not long ago. Thank you, may I get one? On the other hand. Uh, you can go the other direction here, Schneider Optics. This is one of their lower priced ones, only $3,300. Um, in looking on the web, I found out that in that movie, The Social was the one about the, the origin of Facebook. Anybody saw that movie? Not The Social Contract, that's... The social movie. Network. The Social Network. They had, they used a tilt shift lens, probably one of these Schneider things for the filming. And it was like one of the few times it's ever appeared in a movie that I saw it. They're flying over London, I think the Thames is below. And uh, also Colbert, Stephen Colbert, apparently in the intro to his TV show, they used tilt shift video as well. That'd be, well, the Schneider optics for the people do that are $7,000 and up. Okay, here's a recently released shift only from Venus Optics, which is also Lowa. It's a 15 millimeter, real wide angle for Nikon F and Z, Sony E and Canon EF mounts. And it's an intermediate price. You've already seen you can buy a bellow system and pretend you're Ansel. Then we get to the much lower price and I'll be out of talk before long, incidentally. Lens babies. And I, I got this sort of thing before I ever got into uh, tilt shift. 
as such. And I still remember, you know, you bring it to the club, you show the picture, and five people all say, oh, lens baby. I did that. So here's a lens baby composer. You can buy them in umpteen mounts. Nikon F and Z, Canon F, RF, they're mirrorless, and EF, Fuji Film X, Micro Four Thirds, and Pentax. And this is the version that uses their optical swap system. This is a Sweet 35. The Sweet refers to the fact that the focus is sharpest in the center, the sweet spot. And uh, you can unscrew that and pop in another lens. And you move it all around manually while looking at the back of your camera to see where you're looking. And this, with this particular optic swap in there is $350. Hey, Daryl. Yep. Yeah, Lens Babies, man, you talk, they've advertised the heck out of that for years in photo magazines, but On the hand. Uh, what do you, what's your thoughts about this Lens Baby thing? Is it, is it even, is it not a good deal? Is it worth oh, it? I've, I've got a number of photos. The thing is with judges, I find that often go, I'm channeling Rue here, they'll often go, oh yeah, you see, and you go, oh boy, you know, they're going to say, I used the lens. But, you know, I do a lot of photography for myself. Yeah, I've learned about these judges, but, uh, <laughs> but I do a lot of pictures where I say, I like this. So here's a lens space, this is handheld, slapped on the front of a, of a Nikon. So I'm hand holding it. So it's not the sharpest throughout. If I put it on a tripod, it went a lot better. But you can see that these are all largely in focus. Well, then I just bent the thing. So what do you think the quality of the lens baby is okay? Oh, it can be really good. Yeah, actually. Mm -hmm. Especially those new lenses, the, the optic swap. I mean, there are lens babies that have plastic lenses. Mm -hmm. And you can tell they're plastic lenses. So here I, I tilted it but, uh, by just grabbing it and bending it and held it there. And you can see it's sharp right here mm -hmm. and gets progressively unsharp going right. Now, you see, I, I took this one to be sharp because, you know, otherwise this poor creature, he or she's a dog. That was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> oh. We got it. We got it. And then, Kara, nearing the end here, you go out. This is Lens Baby Composer. Uh, this is one with the sweet spot in the center. Look what happens. Yeah. Going out from it. It's not good at the at the fringe, huh? Well, I could do better. Okay, here's one. I've gotten down low. This is a hillabore, Lenten Rose. I'm down on the ground here because they hang over. With a macro lens, a lens baby, and see, all manual, I was able to get the pistols and stamens sharp. And then you see as you go out from there, progressively less sharp. Right. Now, here's the deal you can do with some lens babies. You can, not so much this particular one with this particular lens in it, but you can move it around, or you can have that be sharp and the rest of the image not. Even if things over here are closer to you. So that's one big deal about lens baby. Go visit their website. They'll step you through all sorts of uh, sample photos. So, so Daryl, yep. is, there, is there anything you can do with lens baby that you can't do with radial blur later uh -huh. on? I knew when you saw this, I knew somebody would bring it up. <laughs> yeah. okay, so um, we've already talked about when you do tilt, uh, how they get everything in focus, how you can try to counter that by stopping down your aperture or by um, doing focus stacking. But it has drawbacks. That does. Uh, we'll shift. Well, you know, I think I left something out with shift because I was jumping around there. I've got to, got to show it to you, which you could not do any other way. But yeah, so I agree in this case, yeah, you can do radial blur. Make it back to this thing. I, I jumped over it. How did I do that? <laughs> 
because I got so excited about, okay. Okay, here's what you can do. The other thing was shift. This is a picture I grabbed off the web. You know how you take a picture of somebody in a mirror and unfortunately you're in the mirror too? Unless you get way over the side and then everything you get all kinds of perspective problems. Notice that's not here. What the, the photographer is standing here and has slid the thing to the right and has the model and her mirror image there with the mirror image in focus, you don't see the photographer at all. So is it kind of like a periscope? Yeah. <laughs> so Daryl? There's something about that mirror in my commercial background, I had to photograph mirrors that were for sale a couple of times. Oh, and you could not be in the mirror. In the mirror, I couldn't right. be in the image and so on. Well, with a shift operation, I could put a plain or a, maybe a white sheet draped with few wrinkles in it and light it for the mirror to see. But I was over at the side and the shift put the reflection of, of in the mirror uh, in there and nothing else. And I wasn't in it anyway. I wanted to ask one other thing. You mentioned something about micro four thirds lenses. I don't know how many people in our group know, but micro four thirds is what I think is a truly marvelous cooperation between manufacturers to where micro four thirds is a cross brand platform means that a micro four thirds lens will work on any micro four thirds camera, no matter who made the lens and no matter who made the camera. You don't get into that anywhere else other than micro four thirds. Yeah, Olympus and Panasonic. Olympus, of course, recently sold off their imaging division. It has been picked up by another group called OM Solutions. And uh, there's much speculation about what's going to happen there. Uh, a rumor, kind of interesting, Sony has demonstrated a micro four thirds sensor. These are smaller than, uh, way smaller than a 35 mil. What ends up, you can make the lenses a lot smaller. There are people in the club who shoot micro four thirds, like Al. Uh, Sony has developed a 45 megapixel micro four thirds sensor. Hey, Daryl. Yeah. So, you know, naturally when you, when you, you know, you're shooting, one of the common problems you have is you get your reflection in the image somehow. You have reflection. You don't want you in it. So this, the that's tilt right. system allows you to avoid that, reduce that, right? That's right. Yeah. That's a big problem that you run into often. I got a great picture, but I'm in it. Yeah. And certainly in the days before Photoshop, but, you know, trying to remove that junk in Photoshop just takes time and it's not always easy. You know, the lens, you use your lens and especially if it's affordable, it's, you're done with it. Yes. And anytime you manipulate your images in Photoshop or how you cut it, whether it's a TIFF or a RAW, you're still having some destructive processes going on. So if you got a lens and you can get it done in one fell swoop, go for it. That's why I see it. We get better quality anyway. And, and I have to say that, um, so I'm, I'm moving towards, in the full frame world, I'm moving towards Nikon Z. They're mirrorless. They have been able to increase the diameter of the mount, lets in more light, allow them to do lens designs they could not do previously. I've seen Canon with their RF is doing the same kind of thing. And the lenses are incredibly sharp. I had a picture that I took with one of those that was in, when was it, January when Robin Davis judged? She thought it was over sharpened. It was the lens that did it. I didn't have to do it with Photoshop. I'm going to have to dumb it down. <laughs> so I actually, I use in Nick, I use a thing called uh, mute. It, it softens the image a little bit. And so uh, I want to allow a shift only recently because the tilt, if I'm going to do landscapes, much of the time I can get away with focus stacking. But what you can do with shift, you can't do any other way, not easily. You can't make those buildings upright well. Uh, you can't do this mirror trick. 
you can't do a panorama without turning the camera and getting parallax problems. So ship for me. Any more questions? So Daryl? Yeah. So it's really the shift part that still has a real near view. I think so. It benefit and still advantageous as compared to depending on Photoshop to fix such problems. Right. Yeah. yeah and, uh, I, still, I still have a look no. at some cameras. Incidentally, if you want to buy Nikon F mount lenses, I'm unloading a lot of them. You know, there are, you know, anytime you can walk away from the shot, depending depending on what you're doing, and not have to screw around with it in Photoshop and not get despair and tired of doing photography, you'll be out in the field a lot more if you just get it done right the first time out in the field. Yeah. And that's the advantage of it. Of course, oh, you shoot Fuji now. You can get and that is that called Fuji X? Is that the Fuji mount? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. It's the X yeah, it's two, X three, well, X four. You can get the Sam Yang that does a Fuji X mount. Let me, I, I just think a lot of people get burnt out on photography when they get so dependent on, I'll just Photoshop it later. Well, they may not. And then when they start doing it, they kind of regret it because it does wear you down and it depends on what you're trying to do. But you know, if you do it right the first time, then you don't have to do all that. And a lot of people just get tired of staring at the computer all day because they stare at the phone and the computer's at work. You know what I'm saying? And so it's just a, I say, get it done right the first time. And you have a, a smart, if a you know if a tilt lens is something you can do and you do a lot of architecture then go for it and get it done not have to goof around with it in photoshop yeah incidentally the original lens babies that are still sold they're basic models you change the aperture by dropping in things that look like washers that you would use you know and those are called waterhouse stops waterhouse stops i that's right and it they and uh, the lens holder is magnetized. So you drop it in and click. It magnetically pulls into place. You want to change the aperture?